A lot of people catch up to the JoJo anime and become JoJo fans, full of passion and excitement. If you play games, you want to play a JoJo game as fun and creative as what you just watched. You then wonder, what's the best JoJo game? Don't worry friends, I know the answer. Objectively, it's JoJo Siwa Live to Dance on Android! Seriously, who is this girl? She keeps showing up when you look up JoJo. Actually, that was completely insincere. Don't answer that. I don't want- Okay, for real. What's the best JoJo game? Now, the safest choice is the Capcom JoJo Fighter. But, for me and probably a lot of people, that's a victory by default. JoJo games aren't good on average. Let me be clear. Heritage for the Future is a solid game. It's gorgeous and mechanically impressive. Personally, I think the controls are kind of stiff, they didn't age well, but the game still warrants respect. It's famous for all the crazy stuff you can do. But at its core, it felt like just a traditional fighter with a JoJo spin. You're tested for fighting game fundamentals, which isn't quite the key appeal of JoJo. So it never really scratched that JoJo itch for me. However, if you look at other JoJo games, you understand why the Capcom fighter is the best by default. With modern JoJo games, you run into another problem, the fan service game. Games that are aggressively mediocre, so they try to obfuscate it with admittedly good visual fidelity and heavy use of fan service. They just want you to clap because you recognize the panel or scene they're referencing. But the games are so dull, so nothing, you might as well be watching JoJo action figures spew quotes. Yeah, yeah. Because the games are so boring, you just look up compilations of their animations on YouTube, go, oh, that's neat, and then move on with your life. It's funny that while JoJo is beloved for its creativity, the games based off of it can be so uninspired. See, pure fan service ain't enough. Give me some actual substance. A JoJo highlight reel is nice and all, but to be a truly great JoJo game, you have to add to the JoJo experience. Be a game that understands why JoJo works, and uses that understanding to make something new. A new chapter. Not make the creative equivalent of a rerun. Hey, hey, I've seen this one. I want more Revengeances, not Survives. More Mandalorians and KOTORs, less J.J. Abrams Star Wars. <laughs> works that rely on fan service happen because you lack the skill to make something that stands on its own. You're either fans whose passion outweighs their talent, or cynical producers, pandering to make a quick buck off the IP. Fortunately, for my point, there's already an example of a spiritual sequel in the JoJo fandom, Blood Sun Vendetta. It's a Patreon-funded fan series made by Mick, aka Rice Pirate. With a sliver of a budget, Blood Sun Vendetta is JoJo. The presentation, the style, how it can build tension, the abundance of weird idiosyncrasies like non-stop geography trivia, Every element of Blood Tongue Vendetta screams JoJo. It understands why JoJo works, replicates it, and most importantly, makes something new. Blood Sun Vendetta doesn't rely on references as a crutch. It just uses them as delicious icing on top, as fan service should be. Mick is an extremely talented man who can make good things in their own right and loves JoJo. That's why Blood Sun Vendetta works. So, our any JoJo games JoJo enough? Is there a game somehow better and more JoJo than a game made by Capcom near their peak? Well, there is one game, but it's not on the open market. If you go into the back alleys of the internet, into the dark web known as Tumblr and Red Chanet, you might have come across what I'm talking about. The ultimate best JoJo game is... A fan game made in RPG Maker 2000 that looks like a Game Boy original game. Alright, I know I've got a lot to justify here, but this, this is the shit! This rules! JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the 7th Stand user, is an RPG that covers the entirety of Part 3, Stardust Crusaders. In it, you, the player, control the eponymous 7th Stand user. You join Jotaro and the gang in their adventure across the globe to kill the evil vampire Dio in 50 days, before Dio's curse kills Jotaro's mom due to ghost aids. It's up to the player's actions whether or not they'll follow the same events of the story, or completely subvert them. Though, 
Also, depending on how you play, you'll find the events of the story have been subverted all along. So, first of all, 7 Stand User is free, so that's a pretty big sell for cheap bastards like me. Secondly, if you're familiar with some anime games and self-indulgent fanfiction, this premise might sound pretty familiar. A new original character that's a placeholder for the audience so they can project themselves into a pre-established story? Hmm... Sounds like your typical self-insert, doesn't it? I'm sorry, Brian! You're so strong and cool! <laughs> Please don't kill me! Suck my dick, Artard! <laughs> well, what separates 7th Stand User and its contemporary anime games with create a character protagonist or self-insert fanfics is its high quality. I'm a firm believer that execution is everything, so even if you've got a schlocky premise like the self-insert fantasy, there's nothing inherently preventing that idea from being good. The blind self-insert protagonist is usually terrible, because, yeah, you play as a non-person. In most anime games and stories, the protagonists are deliberately mute, so the broadest audience possible can project onto them. I think the reality is that for most people, it actually ejects them from the story, whenever the protagonist is involved. They just have to turn their brain off, and try not to think too deeply about scenes where your blank slate is being addressed. The story has to pretend that this anime protagonist, usually a dead silent, mass murdering, omni capable ball of death and destruction, is like a real person. But real people aren't completely passive and devoid of personality. It's like the characters have to pretend to be your friend to avoid the ire of this robotic death entity. Seven Stan User sidesteps this problem by giving your protagonist an actual personality. But it still keeps the self insert dream alive and well. Because it's not one set personality that many people have to relate to, it's specifically your personality. The protagonist of Seven Stand User is the closest thing most people will ever get to seeing themselves in the JoJo universe. How the hell does Seven Stand User do that? Do you have to mail your spit in to the developer? Send your social media history to them so they can program you in? Nah son, it does the raddest thing ever. It gives you a personality test! Okay, that probably isn't too exciting for a lot of you, but trust me. The game innocuously starts off with a personality test, but it doesn't just give your protagonist a rough approximation of your personality, which is already pretty neat. It trumps every other personality test, because your result isn't some letter or number salad, it's a stand! A super specific, super unique, funky ass superpower as a ghost designed to encapsulate you a bizarre looking manifestation of your soul as a crazy superpower. In 7th Stand User, you're one test away from getting a freshly made, tailor fit stand. That's fucking awesome! That's a dream most JoJo nerds have! To give you a glimpse of why 7th Stand User is wild, there are 18 unique stands with unique personalities for all of them. That's two more personalities in MBTI! Who cares about being the ugh, logistician? My personality is a fucking wave motion cannon strapped to my arm! The stands all have two classifications, range and class, which is an interesting take on stands. Stands in this game can be the standard punch man, like the close range power type Red Garland, which is star platinum if he purely min-maxed into gains. But befitting of Jojo, it can get way more bizarre. There's Napalm Death, the close range special type stand that's a pen that creates bombs with its ink. There's Caravan, a mid range support type stand that's a sentient bird dude carrying a dimension worth of guns, bombs, and soft drinks in a bag. There's the close range swarm type stand, specials, that's literally just six sentient ghost dudes. There's also the long range swarm type stand, Adam Ant, which is, I quote, a microscopic insect horde, numbering 1,000 in total. Again, all personality tests are irrelevant compared to the one created in this fan video game. All of these 18 stands have designs, powers, and are all music references. So huge props to the developer Clayman for making this personality test. I forced many a friend to take it over the years. Do you think the ends justify the means? Damn. Would I kill a billion people to save a trillion people? Would you kill a billion people for a good pull on the gotcha? <laughs> Would I kill a billion people 
for Eula. You know what? Yeah, sure. <laughs> totally. The ends justify the means. Do what you gotta do, soldier. <sighs> do you think that people are fundamentally evil by nature? Hmm. By nature. Yeah, we're, we're a pretty disgusting animal. But, you know, we curb that. With our upbringing and our, our, our values and whatnot. So, yeah, yeah. Do you ever find yourself thinking, women are scared? What kind of fucking person <laughs> do you think you are? Are you an incel? <laughs> what subreddits do you browse? Yeah. Again, it's a, do you think women are scary? I think you answering fucking, like, yes to the end just by the means I've been like, what the fuck is up with this psycho? <laughs> you know what? I want to see where this rabbit hole goes. I'm going to say yes. Women are kind of scary. They have they have powers and shit. And they, they make me feel bad. Some loser. <laughs> I'll remember this. I think I've got it. Your stand is Elliot Rogers, the school shooter. <laughs> <laughs> so this time we got Howlin' Wolf. Damn. That's pretty cool. But there's a whole game after the test, so let's get back to it. When I took the personality test, I ended up with a stand called Miracles. It was a long range controls type stand. It manipulates the subconscious using bioelectricity to make the user invisible to others. Which honestly was a little off putting. When taking the test, I kinda did want something at least a little badass, but I ended up with this cute little Digimon instead. I felt a twinge of disappointment, but realized something. That's how most new stands seem. Their super specific powers don't appear immediately strong, and just seem kinda weird. But as you see more of what they can do, you realize how awesome they can be if you get creative. That's how all of JoJo works. JoJo constantly evokes the joy of learning to love a new thing. But, this game isn't written by Araki. Is this game JoJo enough to make miracles cool? We'll have to wait and see. So I read the game's personality description of who I was, and while it wasn't a perfect read on me, it felt close enough. But then my protagonist spoke. In response to a ghost-like voice appearing in his room over the radio and granting my protagonist Lo a stand, Lo's response was to go, uh, Okay, I'll call out my stand, but uh, could you please leave? There's nothing valuable to steal here? Oh my god, that is literally me. My introverted, self loving anxiety ridden ass is a JoJo. My curiosity had been piqued after getting a stand from a personality test, and it was rewarded. At this point, I had to see how much 7 stand user had to offer. The voice over the radio gives you a vague request to defeat Dio, but you decide to just go to school. After you leave your house, you're in Japan, going to the same school as Jotaro, and you get treated to the average 7 stand user experience, facing 1 billion mobs and bumping faces with everything to try and interact with it. Sounds like an old fashioned JRPG, right? Well, kinda, but the world interaction is where 7 stand user shows how absolutely bonkers it is. When exploring the world, the game reminds you that you're a stand user, constantly. The stand that represents you isn't limited to combat. Your interactions with the world change depending on the unique power of your stand. Miracles, with its power to manipulate perception, let me turn invisible to spy on several people for monetary gain. Miracles wasn't only limited to invisibility, however. No, Miracles isn't some boring-ass, straightforward X-Men power. You see, Miracles manipulates the subconscious, and this game runs with that. I caught someone's wild cat, not by turning invisible, but by just making it docile. I found a depressed, freshly dumped student and used the power of mind hacking to make him feel better. Which clearly won't help him in the long run, but who cares, he gave me a sweet stat boosting item. One of Miracle's biggest events was when I stumbled across an incredibly nervous couple, and by using Miracles to give them a little bit of courage, they proposed to each other. If they have a kid, I just helped create life with Stando Power! Little moments like these are littered throughout the game and go a long way in fulfilling the fantasy of having powers. As Chronicle and Part 4 have shown us, if you had superpowers, you wouldn't just use them to fight things. A big part of the dream of being superhuman is how you'd use your powers to improve your everyday life. But that isn't to say the game forgets the big things. 
Your stand's abilities are relevant during story events as well. Because Miracles is a long-range stand, it could intervene in canonical fights that close-range stands like Silver Chariot couldn't. Miracles was able to fly alongside Jotaro and Iggy as they glided across the desert to punch a blind man to death. It could help Kakyoi beat up a son. I could even try doing big cheats of Miracles during Darby's poker game. Miracles aside, there are plenty of crazy things other stands can do. I will point to the Death 13 fight. For context, basically the Stardust Crusaders are forced to take on an evil baby on a plane flight because it's sick and needs to get to town to be treated. There's only one available plane, the spare plane's busted, so they have to fly with the baby. The evil baby then attacks them. Death 13 battle ensues. So if you have the healing stand cardigans, you just heal the baby. So there's no need to take it with you and you avoid the fight entirely. <laughs> if you have Carpenters, the repairing stand, you just fix the extra plane, so you don't need to share one. Crap baskets! <laughs> it's amazing and hilarious that your protagonist stand can subvert entire arcs because of their stand abilities. Because the game logically deduced it should. You still fight someone, but it's a really thoughtful cameo from a Part 4 character. God, the love and attention to detail in this game is insane! As a player, you'll never forget what your stand powers are, because the game won't let you. From stand battles to just walking around town, this game gives you a tangible glimpse of what your life would be like as a stand user in JoJo's bizarre world. And in my case, it very accurately depicted how useless I'd be to the Stardust Crusaders. <laughs> Eventually, I had helped out Jotaro in fighting off Kakyoin, though in reality, I only blinded Kakyoin a hundred chapters early. Jotaro beat Kakyoin unconscious before I even landed a hit with miracles. This ineffectual demonstration somehow won over Joseph and company, and they asked if I could help in the fight against Dio. I chose to humbly accept, though I was incredulous about how useful I could be with a stand like miracles. And so, Lo joined Jotaro and friends in their global escapades. Stardust Crusaders as a story was a world tour, probably so Rocky could justify his own vacation as a work expense. Every arc could be a new location with a stand user of the week formula. That structure actually fits perfectly for a JRPG. You go to a new location like Calcutta or Hong Kong, you explore, and see the local sites with the Part 3 crew. But the rub is, you have stands and mercenaries to try to assassinate you every- Five feet. And with that, I have to go over the combat in 7 Stan User. Uh, there'll be a ton of trash mobs on the map, so get ready for that. But during key boss fights, combat can feel exciting and tactical. Satisfying stand powers are a rarity in games, because they're so unique and roundabout, they aren't really figured out at the moment. Fortunately, they're done really well in this game. As a unique twist on JRPG combat, ranges actually matter, because your enemies will often move so you have to pick the right attack for the right range. If you don't, Star Platinum's Aura Aura will do one whole damage on that distant enemy. Stand abilities are also simplified to a myriad of debuffs, and unlike most JRPGs, debuffs actually work for the most part. Miracle's core strategy is to constantly blind opponents, and that makes them miss all the time, thus mitigating tons of damage that can easily kill you. The best defense is not getting hit, after all. But this is balanced by the fact that debuffs wear off quick, so you have to actively manage them. Also to balance things, stands like Miracles that focus on debuffing usually aren't great offensively. However, effective debuffs are a double-edged sword, because that means the enemy's debuffs work too. Managing your debuffs and the enemies is a key part of the combat. The game will eventually introduce ice elementals as random mobs. Unless you can kill them immediately, just run. Never be too afraid, or too proud, to run from a mob in this game. Especially if they're annoying. It's very easy for them to all freeze you, and stunlock you to death, even in the late game. It's very easy to die in this game in general, in battles, and in story events. And as a reminder, this is an RPG Maker 2000 game. What are autosaves? Get your futuristic technology out of here! Save often, and rotate through saves. You'll thank me later. Befitting my unimpressive protagonist, Lo was mostly left to debuffing. Miracles could make people hallucinate pain, but in the early and mid game, that didn't actually hurt that much. So if he was on his own, I discovered that the best strategy was to cripple his opponent's senses, 
and then pull out guns, grenades, a UV laser rifle, or even a goddamn bazooka to blow them away. Which, yeah, I think that's how most battles with miracles would go. Alessi, the child-killing, discord-moderating, smash player, also carried weapons with him to safely complement his stand's lack of direct combat power. The game doesn't explicitly say this, but yeah, it gives you a myriad of consumable weapons for a reason. It's so that protagonists with less offense-oriented stands can still contribute to fights. I was so focused on my stands' abilities, I thought of them like Pokemon, and forgot that I was a participant in the fight too. All of this was an unexpected, but realistic piece of world building. What's this? Storytelling through mechanics? Very impressive, Clayman, very impressive. But usually, my protag didn't need to fire off his bazooka. That's what Jotaro and the gang were for. My protag ended up being a major team player, protecting the party with debuffs. Speaking of the Big Mara boys, let's talk about your party. The story content mechanics keep coming. There be social links in this game. That's right. You get friend points, called FP, for interacting with specific areas with the right party member. If you're super horny for these Beefcake Part 3 boys, this might temporarily satiate your ceaseless hunger. But even outside of horniness, in theory, it's a neat little core mechanic that encourages you to hang out with the Part 3 cast. You end up spending way more time with him than in the original source material. I got to hear Joseph go nuts over Twinkies and chastise me for not knowing his favorite movie Spaceballs. Apparently Abdul is so well-traveled that he's constantly running into old friends. Jotaro is a surprisingly chill dude to hang out with. Iggy and Polnareff are mostly what you'd expect. In a surprising twist, Kakyoi treats you a lot differently if you're a dude. He basically spends most of his hangout encounters pranking you. But if you play as a girl, all those ball-busting encounters flip into straight-up flirtatious events. That sly motherfucker. Exploring the world with your party is nice. When I wasn't being assaulted by the non-stop snipers, mounted cavalry, and enemy stands every few seconds, it actually kind of felt like I was on vacation. All these neat FP events added up. I actually felt like I got to know these characters a little better than I did in the original story, which, sorry to say, I thought the crew of Part 3 were pretty boring. So elevating my opinion of them while having them still feel in character is quite an achievement for a fan game. Now, I say this is really cool, in theory, but there's no real way to know where FP events are. It's more manageable early on, when areas aren't that big, but I don't see many people having the patience to interact with everything, in every map, with every party member, in the vain hope that it'll get an FP. The same goes for all events on the map. There's so much stuff you can miss on every level. I know this is to encourage exploration, but personally this is way too harsh and unreasonable. An unfortunate flaw in this game is that to experience all it has to offer, you kinda need the 7 stand user wiki's walkthrough open at all times. An easy fix for this off the top of my head would be to have giant exclamation marks in the world, notifying you of unique events, but I have to remind myself that it's an RPG Maker 2000 game, so that might be asking too much. Having high enough FP has a myriad of benefits. First of all, they'll start calling you by your nickname you set, which is just cute. In the latest version of the game, you can do unique dual techs with party members you're good enough friends with, with unique fluff on how your stands are working together. For example, Invisible Torture Chamber is where Joseph uses Hermit Purple to immobilize the enemies, while Miracles severely traumatizes them with intense simulated pain. Having high enough FP is another way, outside of having the right stand for the right situation, that you can alter the flow of the story. The ending is actually completely dependent on FP who you're best friends with. Maybe Abdul can live in his ending. Maybe Kakyoin can live. Or maybe everyone can live. Who's to say? Random pro tip, but sleep with Jotaro. After he learns a move, Starbreaker, of course. So he can break you in. I mean, learn new moves. Feel free to save scum this, because surprise, surprise, there's even story content if you sleep. If you go to bed with a party member, you can have unique little vignettes with the other characters. But it takes in-game days to sleep, and there's a 50-day time limit, so safe scumming this is encouraged. At the whims of RNG, Jotaro will just have a random burst of inspiration and come up with a new move, Star Shower, which is him aura-auraing rocks everywhere. 
saves him again, and he can learn another move, Star Sword. I'm not kidding, that's what it's called. Polnareff goes to Jotaro to ask for stand advice, considering Jotaro pulled Starfinger completely out of his ass. Jotaro then tells Polnareff that he's a more experienced stand user, so why the hell is he asking Jotaro for advice? Then, Jotaro realizes that he can probably use Starfinger like a sword, unlocking a fantastic, efficient mid-range attack. Star Platinum having a finger sword also makes Polnareff completely obsolete and redundant. Thanks to the power of luck, perseverance, loading saves, and friendship, Lo made it all the way to Cairo. And he was quite a different person for it, though the process definitely wasn't instantaneous or drastic. Half the time, after winning encounters, Lo was on the verge of passing out. He couldn't swim, so he was drowning for most of the underwater fight with Dark Blue Moon. Even though he chose to help Jotaro fight Yellow Temperance in those cable cars, his fear of heights was still palpable. And while he soundly defeated Darby the Gambler, as soon as the fight was over, my protag was like, Dear God, don't ask me to do that shit again! I think I saw my life flash before my eyes, holy shit! By the way, the way this game handles the non-combat battle with Darby the Gambler is incredible. Clayman, the developer, aimed to make it an Ace Attorney style reasoning game, and they passed with flying colors. You have to figure out how Darby is cheating, but it's not quite that simple. Sure, you can use the source material as a hint, but Darby cheats in ways unseen in the manga. For me, this encounter was the most tense in the game. My brain racked as I cautiously tried to deduce how Darby was cheating, but losing soul chip after soul chip for getting it wrong. It's an all-time gaming memory highlight for me. It was a hard wrought journey, but my protag finally made it. He crossed the globe, fought off dozens of assassins, stand user or otherwise, pushed on in spite of his fears, and got all the way to Dio. He started off his journey as a regular, fearful high school student, without much belief in himself. He'd gotten stronger physically, sure. He had a stand, a weapons arsenal the Punisher would be proud of, and picked up some ripple techniques from some books in his travels. But getting physically stronger is meaningless, if he was still the same unsure kid he was at the start of his journey. And he wasn't. He had grown into a much better, more confident, more experienced person, and became a better stand user as a result. Miracles even developed to the point, by grinding, where the simulated pain was somehow physically manifesting. The subconscious manipulation was so advanced that Miracles was somehow psychosomatically setting people on fire and doing some real damage. That's pretty damn creative. In fact, that's pretty Jojo. Great job, Clayman. At the end of the game, as my character stood around Dio's coffin with the Jojo crew, he finally completed his arc. After a 50-day, bizarre adventure, Lo is finally ready to face his fears head-on, even if that fear was something as terrifying as Dio himself. And, at the end of it all, as difficult as it was, he fought Dio, and he won. His journey was incredibly fulfilling and relatable. This anxious, self-loathing introverted kid who didn't like to be seen faced the same hardships as the stoic mega-badass that is Jotaro. And he still pulled through. His stand wasn't as obviously as powerful as Jotaro's Star Platinum, but it didn't need to be. He just needed to be the best him that he could be. This theme hit home way harder than most other stories, because I had made this character me at the start of the game. I love that this game succeeded where many other games failed, and made me feel like part of the story. This game really makes you feel like the 7th stand user. Is your protagonist the best written character? No, of course not. But it's a unique, ambitious experiment that was a total success. My protagonist wasn't just a blank slate with a stand, it was me as a Jojo character. A character is more than a power set and look. It's a series of relationships, hardships, and lessons learned. I was an actual Jojo character, one who had undergone an arc, 
and it was more satisfying than any stray fantasy you could have in your head, because this was a fully realized story. Seven Stan user does this without much, if any, dialogue choices, which isn't a bad thing. Most dialogue choices are functionally just exposit more to me, followed by clearly correct choice. Those aren't real choices. Seventh Stand user streamlines choices by removing the by nature filler dialogue choices and only has the actual branching decisions. It's a radical departure from typical game design, but a well thought out one. It doesn't matter that you don't have dialogue choices because of the personality test. Your dialogue is being written with your personality in mind. So generically positive dialogue choices that hope to relate to as many people as possible are pointless. And in my opinion, totally inferior. It works well and breathes a surprising amount of life into the experience. My character felt like he was an actual part of the world, someone who the other characters talked to, someone with strengths and weaknesses, a person. It's such a night and day difference in immersive flow, there aren't pauses in scenes for a mute protagonist, you're not forced to choose bland dialogue options. Your 7th stand user is not a bland, blank robot awkwardly shoved into a story, they're you as a real JoJo character. And because of that, it's an amazing experience unlike any other I've had in games. It just goes to show that you could have as complex and expensive a character creator as you want, but looks are only skin deep. In terms of actual investment and impact, it can't compete with a well-written story tuned to the player. That's the unique power of story content in games. Now, what happened to Lo after he defeated Dio? How did he defeat Dio in the first place? I won't go into too much detail for what happened in my ending, but to give you perspective on how crazy my ending was, Dyer, the joke Ripple user who died in part 1 over a hundred years ago, yeah he came back and killed Dio with his infamously useless Thundercross split attack! I wasn't even aiming for this to happen! This happened organically! This game is the ultimate fan service! And as I've hopefully made clear, this is a real ass game. Fan service with substance is a-okay. This icing ain't hiding a shitty cave. So, after Dyer got his revenge, my protagonist lived on to part four. Ten years after beating Dio, he became a successful manga author, which properly spooked me, because right now I'm trying to be an author too. Lilden spots Jotaro and Joseph walking around his town of Morio, and then joins their investigation of the serial killer plaguing part four. Jeez, I didn't ask for a personalized epilogue on top of a character arc, but I got one. And god, it's such a lovely cherry on top, getting to imagine Lowe's adventures in Morio. If you get to the end of a playthrough, you'll get your own unique ending too. So yeah, if you want to experience all this radness, don't change your stand at the start. Even if it's tempting because you think your stand's lame. You're actually invalidating the entire point of the game, missing this entire journey. It's an extremely stupid decision, and you should feel bad if you make it. Save that, I wanna pick the coolest stand, shit for your second playthrough. That's right, second. This game has absurd replay value. The journey doesn't end when that pop of music plays as the credits roll. If you were thorough in your exploration, or were checking a guide as per my advice, you likely got a badge of honor in your playthrough. So, after the ending, you're booted to a dev room, and 7th stand user truly goes batshit. You can use that badge of honor for a new game plus. Now you can give it a shot with a different stand, with a much breezier experience, because all your gear and party member XP carries over through playthroughs. If that's too easy, you don't have to. You can reset your gear and XP. It's up to you. And remember, a new stand means a new main character. That means the game can surprise you again. You can see a new journey, see how busted all the other stands can get. Have your stand's relevance change how certain fights go down. That's 17 additional playthroughs you can do. While you're at it, aim for a new ending. There's variants on every ending depending on the stand. So there are a whopping 54 possible endings to see. Everyone can live. Everyone can die. You can run off with whole horse. You can work with Dio if you're evil enough, and then kill your entire party you just had a whole adventure with. God damn, that's fucked. And then you can betray Dio to be the true king of the world. Holy shit. And by the way, there are more New Game Plus features. 
you can create stamp battler codes after you beat the game to share with your friends and battle their stands! Here's mine by the way, have fun beating me up. You can also like, go to the afterlife and fight JoJo highlight reels like a revived Wamu and ultimate lifeform cars. Also, you can fight God? Also, if you get nine badges of honor, you can have a playthrough as Josuke, the hero of part four? What? What the hell is this game? So, out of context, it sounds like I'm describing some sort of absurdly successful Kickstarter game, one that had a slew of diverse game features after reaching dozens of stretch goals. It makes sense if a 10 to 15 hour game with insanely high replay value via story content was a Kickstarter. Mind you, you have to spend the time writing story content. You can't generate it like in roguelikes. Ugh, and just the thought of playtesting 19 different main character playthroughs makes me want to die. Only in indie games would a dev aim for the heavens like this. Only an indie would be foolish and ambitious enough to commit to that much content. Be foolish and ambitious enough to tread untested waters with its game design. And, most importantly, have an unbreakable will and resolve to actually achieve its goals to finish the game, as opposed to being abandoned like many other overambitious projects. Clayman is like Toby Fox or Pixel of Cave Story fame. They're talented super geniuses that give young devs the wrong idea about how much a single person can reasonably accomplish. That's right, single. This was all made by a single Japanese person. Clayman spent hundreds of hours making 7 stand user for free as a hobby with no money and no expectation they'd ever see a single yen. This is a freeware fan game. It's impossible for the artist to really profit off of it. Imagine if someone made 18 Undertales worth of content for free. At least Toby Fox got paid to make Undertale. And rightfully so. Clayman, you're crazy. Truly, Japanese autism is the best in the world. The art style of 7th stand user is super simple, and while that might be off-putting, it's the only way this game could be finished. This game was also made in a super outdated game engine by the way, so it was needlessly difficult to code. RPG Maker 2000 is older than most JoJo fans. This game is awe-inspiring and incredible, in spite of its quaint visuals, sound, and engine limitations. It's so good, it has a fan following in and of itself. That's right, this fan game has a fandom. There's fan art, fan movies. Clayman has an ask account for lore questions. Crazy world we live in, huh? If there's another JoJo game, and there will be, it won't be anywhere near as ambitious and thus not as exciting as this. The people who own the IP aren't interested in making exciting or even good games. They're just interested in a return on investment, making their money back quickly on a safe bet, like a bunch of other anime games. You can see this in the entire AAA industry. Ubisoft only makes one kind of extremely safe video game. Seventh Stand User reminded me that it doesn't have to be that way, that inspired game design and intense passion for fresh experiences can still exist. Whenever a new JoJo game's announced, there's always a small fan rumor mill about a JoJo RPG, because people know how good a JoJo RPG can be. If Seventh Stand User actually had a proper budget, 3D visuals, and voice acting, It'd be a smash hit, a historic JRPG. It'd be in the Hall of Greats like Final Fantasy and Persona. The fact that Seven Stand User has such inspired game design and is so dense with content <sighs> makes it genuinely super lame that it only exists as an easily missable, unassuming Japanese fan game. You can see why I put this fan game over the likes of officially licensed games. It's impossible for me not to think Seven Stand User is the ultimate JoJo's Bizarre Adventure game. Maybe the best there will ever be. So, give this game a shot. Links to the wiki and the game are in the description. Hopefully this game can touch you as a JoJo fan, or a game design enthusiast, or both. And finally, thank you Clayman. There's one thing your game taught me. It's that the power to affect hearts and minds isn't a stand but the power of concentrated Japanese autism. Well, that's all for me. Thanks for watching. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, everyone. And goodbye, JoJo!